Good morning. Good to see you all here. Let's start with the word of prayer. Father, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you for your word. And we recognize, Lord, that while we are spiritual beings, we are so normally consumed by our natural concerns, affairs, fears and worries, and hopes and dreams, that often, Lord, we forget that we're here for your purpose and your glory. So bring that to our heart this morning. May you be glorified in our life. And even in today's service, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I have just a couple preliminary things to share, and that is, first of all, this will be the last sermon in Roman numeral one, belonging the universal desire of the heart of God. And of course, we're in this larger context of becoming God's authoritative voice and his fortified brazen wall in this world. And it's just ever so much more significant today that, that, that you and I understand how our faithful presence in the world is so significant. I say faithful presence, meaning as we're focused on the Lord by all rights, proper rights and purpose, at the same time that, that faithfulness does have impact in the world on those around us. So when we got into Romans, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13, we went through all the attributes of love. Of course, we've been talking about love. We've, we've done the book of Esther, we've done the book of Ruth, and uh, we've done most of the book of Samuel. <laughs> the incredible thing is we've ended every year each section around Easter, so we've done some traditional Easter messages. So if you'll look at your bulletin, really would appreciate y'all taking some time this week as a family. There's little family devotionals in the back. But Lord willing, I would like you to do the Palm Sunday reading, which is Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11, <clears throat> and do that together as a family. And uh, that'll probably be one of the primary readings and message will come from that next Sunday. <clears throat> As always, of course, there's a place for you children to follow along with the main points of the reading. But um, as I look on the screen, titled Two, True Glory, Only What's Done for Christ Shall Last, under the doctrine, listening to Matt, I wished I had changed the subtitle instead of Saul's scrappy heritage is lost, scratch Saul and write Israel's scrappy heritage is lost. So. Uh, chapter 31 is so, is so pivotal in terms of the whole story and plan of God. And today, as we have already heard from the communion message, Saul lost it all. He died an ignoble death, was treated with great amount of um, discourtesy. That's not the right word, but that's what comes to my mind treated horribly, his sons were treated horribly, hung up on a wall. And it's just uh, an incredible f falling and failing. But I want us to just remember when, when uh, Matt went back to Ruth, excuse me, to Hannah, and read about the birth of Samuel, I, I realized Samuel's a pivotal book. Because at the beginning of Samuel, God wipes out the priesthood for the line of Eli. And what was the problem with, the, with, with Eli? He, would pre he preferred to have a heritage with his sons that was more acceptable to the worldly mindset. And so when his sons made themselves vile, he did not restrain them. And so the whole continuous line of the priesthood was wiped out entirely. And we saw later on in this book, as we, one of the prior Sundays, how King Saul, in his rage, uh, wiped out virtually all of the priests that were the residue of Eli, totally wiped him out. 
And I said this was to fulfill the, the prophecy. So as we, as we think of these horrific things, Eli's sons dying in battle and the Ark of the Covenant being captured, King Saul wiping out all of the priests with such brutal viciousness of hatred and self-interest. And then um, we come here to chapter 31 and we, we see the end of Saul. But not only Saul, his sons, and Israel. I mean, you have to remember we're talking about a nation. And so here is this nation of Israel who came in their worldly desires. Mommy, I would like to be like my neighbors, that they wear pretty things and I don't get to wear pretty things. I want to be like them. And they begged for a king just because that's what all the pagans had. And as is often is true of us human beings who are charged with being messengers of the word of God and having served God faithfully for so many years of his life, Samuel was hurt. He was a little personally offended. And God rebuked him and said, they haven't rejected you. They have rejected me from being king. And I think that's the most difficult part of our service as Christians in the world that we have. We will meet with rejection. In John, as Christ was doing his final significant teaching at the Lord's, at the, um, what we call the Last Supper, uh, he said, you know, if they've hated me, they're gonna hate you. And if they receive my word, they'll receive your word. So this, this battle that we have, this human battle, getting back up to the outline top, there's this universal desire of our heart to belong. And yet Satan has perverted what it means to belong to worldly, vain, self-centered, sinful things. And so <clears throat> the world today is pressing on just like it has always seems to be making new headways on the right and the left uh, this the, the whole backdrop to why I thought this was a good series to begin with was um, Maryland was getting ready to pass the education law that would be requiring educators in grade school and high school to um, teach the acceptance and the acceptability and exactly to, to promote the, the confusion of non-binary gender. So you can be whatever you want to be. And I, from what I understand, it's kind of interesting uh, this week in Congress, the, uh, the, the Democrats have introduced a binding piece of legislation to put over the whole country that has no religious exemptions at all. It's just, just a rabid thing, and, and the, whole, the whole premise behind it has the strength of human weakness. And I said that on purpose. It has the strength of human weakness, because that's where Satan always wins his arguments. If in the place of human weakness, we can construct something that says, you, you self-centered, know-it-all, advantaged, blah, 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 if you don't always get your way, other people are going to be happy. But you are ruining the world because you're dominating everybody's this and everybody's that. And so there's this constant onslaught against what's true and good and right. And <clears throat> so we, we started this, this whole series from that understanding. But I wanted to just ease into it. I mean, we have, I'm going a tiny bit of a <clears throat> different direction than this in the message as we go along. But essentially, I want you to understand one thing, Israel begged God for a king. Like unto the kingdoms around him. God's plan, well, I'm, you know what, I'm going to pick a king from the lowest tribe in the, whole, in the whole nation of Israel. The one with the smallest number, the most insignificant tribe. I'm going to pick a king from that group. And he picked Saul. 
And Saul was small in his own eyes. Yeah, he was notable in terms of his physical size. And God, God gave this nobody from the smallest tribe in Israel an opportunity to be his servant. Now I want you to just think really quickly in terms of belonging. If God suddenly picked you to be king, wouldn't you feel that special sense of belonging to God in a, in a special way? And wouldn't that be satisfying? And of course the answer is yes, but when you and I belong to the Lord, that sense of value that gives us, the sense of encouragement that we really, we really belong to the Lord, we're really the Lord's. And as we have that sense of belonging, satisfying our soul, we're happy to serve him in whatever call he's put on us, serve the Lord with gladness. And yet, what often happens, and it's because of who God is, when you're serving the Lord because you're one of His, and you're doing His will, He shows up in ordinary things in a big way to get glory for His name and to bring the light of His, of his knowledge into that situation. And so just by being a true, humble servant of the Lord, you'll end up being somewhat significant in that place where He gives you to serve. You'll be somebody that's looked up to. You'll, you'll have stature and status that comes from being a faithful, trustworthy servant of the Lord. And what easily happens to the human spirit is that sense of stature and status can easily go to our head. We can think we're something when we're nothing. And that's what happened to King Saul. And all of a sudden it became about his kingdom. And he became just like all the kings of the, the surrounding nations, just like they wanted. A godless king who's only interested in his own empire and his own stature. And he dies this horrible, ignoble death. And so, as, as we go forward, I want to just pick up on a primary theme here of the Christian life. Do you have a plan? Do you have a, do you have a dream? Do you have hope for a future that you're really excited about and looking to? In John 12, one of the things Jesus said at the Last Supper was this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Accept a corn of wheat. Maybe I should have changed it because corn and wheat sound opposite. Kernel is what it means. Except a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die. It remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Except a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die. It remains alone. Now, this was a farming community, everybody got the message easily. Maybe for you and I, maybe not the same. But one kernel of wheat can produce 30, 60, 100 fold of kernels of wheat. That's the multiplicative process of how God causes the world to grow and prosper and save back seed for next year, but use the rest of the seed to eat this year. But that picture is dying, and that's letting go. And I want us to, I want us to as we go through this, I want us to understand, as we're in transition, we're never called into a place of service so that our satisfaction in that place of service is realized. We're never called into a place of service so that the sense of other people's appreciation and or approval of us is realized. Those aren't the objectives. Those are the objectives of natural man, yes. And even as Matthew was going over the uh, different um, illustrations that he was using of 
what men reflect on about whether their children are doing well. It's so natural for us. It's, so, it's such a part of who we are to want to be able to enjoy some measure of success. And it's imperative that we understand that for you and I to treasure the success of being a grain of wheat, what our feelings are, what our understanding is, is we have to say, wow, look at this, I'm a grain of wheat, this is so wonderful. I mean, I'm going to build a little shrine and stick my grain in there just so everybody can see a grain of wheat. And the value of being a genuine grain of wheat isn't in being a grain of wheat so everybody says, wow, you're a grain of wheat. The value of being a grain of wheat is that you have the power to die to yourself. And of course it's a, it's a parable, so it means us die. Every ambition, every desire, every earthly joy, everything that would motivate the natural man to work hard and do good, those are the things we die to. Those are the things that we say, it's enough, it's good enough, Lord, I don't, I don't have to have these things. And so, we let go. Now look at the poetic nature of this seed. It remains alone, or brings forth much fruit. Remains alone, or brings forth much fruit. I want you to understand one thing. The objective of being successful by the world standard is to be singled out and alone with respect to your greatness and your significance so that you rise to a place of honor and glory. Some, some circles worship because you're so singularly significant. And yet at that place on top you're singularly alone because that's never the objective it's never the objective to win the Super Bowl or the basketball title I guess that's going on now being number one isn't what it's all about what it's all about is realizing number one already is it's the Lord the Lord God and he's taking the heavenly purpose that he has and teaching us to let go of the paltry earthly purpose that we can see and feel and have before us. Let that go and hold on for the greater. And when we let go, we do more than we could ever imagine. And it's important I say it that way, we do more than we could only ever imagine. Because the greatness of man that's plotting to be great requires his imagination at every point. The calculation of doing this and doing that and getting there to get to the top. That's all calculation and it's all limited by the imagination of man. But what God has for us is so far above and beyond what we could ever imagine. Paul says in Ephesians, what we could ever ask or think to ask. So we have the incalculable thoughts of God that are at our um, privileged place of his mercy, where we let go, serve on his terms, look like an uh, uncared for, lost case of unpopularity where, where God gets all the glory. <clears throat> So I don't know why my computer seems to be having problems, but forgive me for. <clears throat> so last time we had this incident where we discussed on the uh, true riches. David, David used the spoils to make friends for himself, which was a New Testament principle as well. And then we see this chapter here of what happens to Israel and what's the problem and how did it feel and I I think enough's been said but it's it's really a little bit beyond 
our capacity right this minute as Americans to think back on Israel's heritage where they finally had a king, they finally had a great noble king and everybody was behind their king and they, they finally had what it took and it all get defiled and wiped out and the royal line is destroyed. <clears throat> That's got to feel totally debilitating and confusing. <clears throat> now we see Saul's sad case. Um, as we'll read in it, well, I don't know if I'm going to go to chapter one. I heard somebody voting for it, but um, first chapter of Sa Second Samuel discovered that Saul fell on his sword, and his his uh, bodyguard was thought he died, so he fell on his sword. But even though he fell on his sword, he still hadn't died, and so he gets somebody else to come along and kill him. But uh, Saul ends his life in a pretty big failure. You can't even kill yourself. And he was he left and he lingered long enough to see the devastating end. And all the soldiers who weren't engaged in the immediate battle saw the falling and the failing and they all they all fled. And the amazing thing is it says that um, uh, they fled their cities. So um, they weren't even going to get up, give up a fight. They just picked up their backpacks and took off and left all their stuff. And so the Philistines came and, and, and lived in their own housing and feasted on their stuff. Uh, very interesting part of that world that they and histories that we very know little, we practically know very little about. And then we see the Philistines coming the next day and defiling the dead in their typical pagan way. <clears throat> and, I, and I just want to pause for a moment as we get pass through. So young person, so dad, so mom, you who are pressing and stretching to be a little more accepted by the world, to have a little bit more, you know, be like the rest of the world, you know, here Israel now finally has their king. I want you to see what it really means to those people you were trying to be like. They have absolutely no respect, no concern or consideration for you whatsoever. The reality is they won the victory over you spiritually first because they got you to want to be like them. Then the next reality is they overtook you and destroyed you personally because they just don't like you. That's what Jesus said. They're going to hate you just like they hate me. And if we're going to live the Christian life in any kind of success, we have to arm ourselves with that understanding. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to have men and women who hate me. And I'm going to suffer persecution. Truth of it is, if you're not suffering persecution, the question is, uh, what message are you speaking? Because the message of the cross, which we're supposed to be speaking, is utter foolishness. To those who are being damned. And so they, excuse me again, again quickly. So, then we have the residents of Jabesh Gilead rescuing the bodies and burning them and burying them uh, near Jabesh and fasting seven days. And that's it's an interesting closing words. I thought they were powerfully redemptive words. The men of Jabesh Gilead revered the bodies. Yes, this had been their king and his sons. And they buried them and took away as much of that shame as possible. However, they did it in the context of memory that God's on the throne and he told us when you bury somebody you've got to have seven day fast and to cleanse yourself from having touched a dead body. So I just, it, it just seemed to me at the very end of this 
difficult, dark tale. We see that speck of faith still being there in the people of Jabesh Gilead. Because what, what else could they have done? Well, you know what happens? It happens all the time in American culture. We have this false expectation of some grandiose consequence of our puny little arrogant centered faith that we call faith. And then it doesn't work out the way we planned. And what do we do? We get uppity. And we first flaunt, well, I served God in a grand way, and I've done this and I've done that, and is this the way I'm going to be treated? Well, if this is the way I'm going to be treated, then just forget it. It would have been easy for these people from Jabez Gilead to be frustrated. But they did have a, a true spark of true faith and respect to God. And that was evident even at the tail end of this horrific end to Israel's first king. <clears throat> now when I go through this little exercise of trying to ask or imagine what else could have been said or done, uh, it's always hard for me to go through it because, well, it didn't happen. So <laughs> I'm, I'm making up stuff and it seems like a false attempt to clarify something. But anyway, so I struggle a little bit going through this. But, um, you know, I was thinking about what else God could have done. Saul was the one that was sinning. He could have just singled out Saul for death. He could have been killed and all of Jonathan and his brothers could have been saved and uh, or, or he could have just killed Saul and Jonathan rise up and turn the battle around and win the day he already had a testimony like David's in that respect and and I you know getting back to the title page of the of the message um, what is really true when it comes to honor and glory. True honor and glory must exclusively be focused on the Lord and His glory and His purpose. And in that respect, in light of that, everything separate from that needs to be diminished in some fashion. And so I don't want to pause and say I know all the ins and outs because I don't. But it is plain that God totally wiped out the first king and his family in the same way that he totally wiped out the last priest of Israel and that's the beginning of the chapter. And God had a bigger purpose and a, and a bigger plan in it. Uh, Saul could have been so self-centered that he could have stayed home and cowardly saved his own life or he could have secretly sent for David to lead the battle and abdicate the throne to him. He, there are other things that he could have done. And I'm um, not sure really that's realistic. Well, Matt was speaking, I thought, well, another thing he, David, Saul could have done is um, he could have gone to Jonathan secretly and said, listen, we're going to be wiped out. You need to get out of here so you can save the kingdom for yourself and try to, you know, make one last stab at preserving his his earthly heritage but he didn't do that um, it could be that you know the men surrounding King Saul could have just risen up in rebellion and said you know you've given us nothing but trouble you know they thought of stoning David just two chapters ago right oh I didn't anybody think about stoning Saul you know that would have been a good idea <laughs> but they didn't um, and of course Jonathan I always I always think about Jonathan. I've never done a thorough study on Jonathan, but I'm, it always amazes me. He, he didn't go AWOL. He could have. He knew what his father was, what he was doing. He could have gone AWOL and just gone and put himself under David. But he didn't. He had a sense of duty. This is who I am. This is where God's put me, and I'm going I'm to serve out my place that God's giving me. In a sense, Jonathan's humility and putting himself under his father's role and reign uh, brought about his own downfall physically, I mean dying. But at the same time, it illustrates Jonathan's heart. 
It wasn't about Jonathan. It wasn't about Jonathan trying to make things right. It was about Jonathan trusting the Lord and his circumstances. Then lastly, the Philistines could have been kept from defiling the Lord's anointed in some fashion, but that didn't happen. So, what are some spiritual lessons? And, of course, I've zeroed in on primarily one today, and I'll like to focus on that for, for you and I. Um, when I was in college, my sophomore year, I, it dawned on me that um, if I didn't have an ideal or an objective to, to shoot for, um, I simply wasn't going to make it. I, I was, because I didn't know where I was going, and I didn't know how to get there, and of course you have to have a place to go in order to figure out what the map is. So in realizing that, I finally pieced together the best Gary plan I could put together. And it began serving my purpose in terms of giving me motivation, giving me direction, giving me a sense of uh, what should I do next, etc. But in that very embarkation on that plan of my own, the kindness of God allowed the Holy Spirit to just whisper into my ear, yeah, right, well, what's good, just your plan going to be if such and such and such happens to you? And I immediately knew, oh, well, I don't have a very good plan and we'll cover that. <clears throat> but I didn't have any other plan, so I just blindly went ahead. So I have a few scriptures here. The first one is really, really, really important for us. You're not going to like this passage if you're a human being, but it so much likes you. So I have A and B and it's all the same passage though. Reading from Corinthians chapter 1. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world has God chosen I think, think I lost my place. In the vase things of the world, the things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not, in order to bring to nothing things that are, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. Uh, I think the hardest human battle that we'll ever have to face, no matter how long we live, it's this battle for glory. When you're in the midst of a very distraught moment, if you were able to take enough steps back to look objectively on what the battle is in your heart, and if God gave you the grace to see objectively, you would, you would see that there's a part of your glory that's at risk of being annihilated in this matter. And you don't, you don't want to let that glory go. I, I had a horrible um, experience one time in a home visit. But um, this dear mom was, uh, they had come to Christ through homeschooling. And as is so often the case, the, the burden and care for the spiritual well-being of the children is burning in the heart of the mom a little bit more um, intensely than in necessarily what she perceives the heart of her husband. And we they've been in the school for quite a few years and it was many years down the path and I was astonished what I heard coming out of my mouth because it seemed like one of the meanest things that I could have said but I, I said to her, I said, you know I think one of your problems is you think God needs you to get this job done. And uh, he doesn't need you. This is about him, about him getting glory. And 
uh, it was it wasn't said with any mean spirit in me it's said with earnestness but she later told me that she went and prayed and she surrendered her her motherhood and the outcome of her children to the Lord and um, really really prayed that prayer Lord you don't need me I, I I surrender my post if that's what you want and then the next thing she told me was I've just discovered that I have cancer and she lived a little over a year um, and died from cancer and of course I remember all the years of her anxiety and concern and the first look at her family after she had passed away and gone on the first look was really disheartening I went to a wedding of one of the children and it was a worldly wedding there was just the regular worldly things that go on at a wedding in a expensive venue and I was so discouraged because I'm like thinking you know <laughs> this dear mom would roll over in her grave if she if she, if she had been here for this because it was just disheartening and I'm really heavy-hearted and I walk out to the pier it's over on the bay there and um, just distraught and total strange couple I mean they were strangers to me that's all I meant they weren't strange <laughs> they were a normal couple they had a suit and tie on and a dress with the proper gender underneath each one and and, um, and they just opened a conversation now they were not believers I think by their own testimony but I uh, or at least this lady had led me to believe they weren't believers before but anyway these people said you know I know this mom and how she dedicated her life to the Lord and these these children and they said you know these children are going to turn out all right and it was put me in tears <clears throat> I didn't know him from Adam they didn't know what I was thinking then they walk away like you know some prophet does when they <laughs> spoken to you and um, so I've kept in touch with the family and uh, my recent conversations with the dad I, I'm amazed all the kids are walking with the Lord and a very very clear strong testimony and you know <clears throat> we we often think about you know who could who could wrong somebody you know who could who could do this or who could do that and all the all the anger that gets welled up in our heart against the evil deeds of men are when they just annihilate innocent situations with with wickedness and with horror but um, painful as this might sound to you the reality is this God is in the business of bringing glory to himself through you and I as weak and insignificant vessels and it's necessary that our insignificance is maintained so that his significance can shine clearly through us and that's that's the heritage that's the hope that's the plan and if, and if your if your goal is to you know make it to the front cover of uh, you know best of Christian family magazine <laughs> you know, I'm not sure that's the objective that God has for, for any of us but he wants us to find him in our negative difficult situations and focus on his glory in that process and it's going to be true but sometimes what we actually see in terms of the eternal glory isn't going to be seen until we're in eternal glory so as he wrapped out the rest of the passage there 
But of him are you, Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. As you engage in the wisdom of God, as you are enabled to put on the righteousness of Christ, as you're sanctified and set apart exclusively to do the Lord's work, not to walk off in your own wild ambitions, <clears throat> and as you let that transformation of the redemption, you know, to walk around with that humility, you're not somebody special, you're redeemed. You've been bought back, so the penalty of your sin has been satisfied. But your natural rights as a human were the natural rights of a sinner that deserved judgment. And so we put those things upon it and then, then we glory in the Lord. We realize what God has done and we give him thanks and we give him glory. Another spiritual lesson here from Luke 9. <clears throat> and he said to them, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and himself be cast away? For whosoever would be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when the Father shall come in his own glory, excuse me, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. <clears throat> you know, that's a very simple, direct application to you and I. I'm called to follow Jesus. I'm called to follow Jesus, that, that's my plan. What does it mean? Well, it does mean that every day there are going to be things in my life that amount to taking up a cross, taking up an instrument of death, saying to that seed, okay, seed, you can't abide alone, you're going to die. And so the glory of the possession of the seed is lost in the letting go of the seed. And we follow the Lord, take up our cross daily. And we, we lose our life, we, we lose that seed. And it's in the losing of it that we find it. Now the mystery is, you don't know what the life is that you're going to find. You just are going to have life. It's going to be more. It's going to be more abundant. It's going to be more glorifying to God than what you have now. But the problem with people that are small, as King Saul illustrates, when you really are small and you really think little of yourself, and you finally have something of value, it's sometimes really hard to let that thing that you finally got let go. To let that go too. But we cling to it and hold on to it. So I always thought about that parable Jesus taught. Remember the guys, the three guys that were given talents as the master went away. And it was the smallest guy, the guy that had one talent. He's the guy that messed up. As, and as it were, as in his smallness, he, he chose to try to preserve what he had instead of letting that go and investing it. And so it's important that we understand here some of the greatest acts of pride and arrogance are the acts of a man or a woman who have a puny view of themselves so that they cling to what little tiny name they have for fear of losing that as well. It always struck me in Romans 12, when Paul is trying to teach us how we ought to think about ourselves. It says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but think of yourselves soberly according to the measure of the gift of God. And it's a remarkable thing to realize that a person who is not thinking of themselves soberly is not thinking of themselves in light of who God made them to be, 
Lord, what are the things that I have? It's like he said to Moses, well, what do you have in your hand? This rod. Okay, I'm going to use that rod. When I'm thinking of myself soberly as I ought, I don't say, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I have nothing, I'm just this puny, meaningless. Don't say that. Be honest and say, Lord, Lord, I don't have much, but I have this and this, and I'll dedicate it to you. It's all yours. Use it as you wish. And that's what God wants to do. The way God is going to transform our lives by causing us to be the source of truth going into the lives of others is when others see, well, he didn't have much, but look what, look what he did with what he had, and they're going to get close and say, oh, no, he didn't did it. God did it. The power of God and the glory of God took that to a higher level. And so it is, now this is going out on a limb here, but I believe if a numerical analysis is done in the end, the sin of pride that thinks of myself more lowly than I ought, the sin of pride that causes me to deny the gifts I do have just because I don't have other gifts that I think I ought to have, that sin of pride is going to be the greater testimony of so many people that wasted their life and the whole time they thought they were living in humility but they weren't your life isn't for you to measure your life is to say oh you know what I have been made in the image of God and in the image of God I have gifts and talents that he's given me and yes I don't have all the talents in the world and that's the demonic assault to think I have to be like God. No, I'm just going to share in that image of God. And when I share in that image, then I let God be glorified in my life. It's a glorious, glorious day when your heart can simply embrace who you are in the eyes of the Lord. So that your hope is in the Lord and your day, you get up in the morning and you say, okay, Lord, I don't know what crosses you have for me today, but by your grace, Lord, I intend to pick everyone up and follow you. And we start to get a little bit of a enthusiastic anticipation as we realize, oh, this cross is a place for me to die so God can be magnified in my life. I want that. I want God to be magnified in my life. So we embrace the cross. We lift it high so that others can see Jesus and also be drawn to him. <clears throat> Today do we see Christians making career and life choices exclusively based on God getting all the glory? Well, that's a pretty hard question to ask, I'll be honest. Um, but I think that we can, I think that we ought to be able to see that. Back to 1 Corinthians 3. <clears throat> Again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. That's pretty disarming. God knows what I'm thinking. As a child, I remember hearing the Gospels be read and so many times an event would begin unfolding and the scripture would say but Jesus knew their thoughts before they even opened their mouths and said anything he's responding to what they were thinking the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain what, what does it mean that they're vain okay so think of a wise Christian man or woman on the earth they're thinking about stuff the Lord knows at the bottom of that self-analysis, there's vanity in it. Something about what's it going to be in for me. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Apollos or Paul or Peter or the world or life or death, or things present or things to come, they're all yours and you're Christ and Christ is God. Do you see the difference between the singular grain of wheat that won't die 
and the one that dies and inherits all things. See, in the end, when, when we get up to heaven and we're <laughs> relishing in all that eternity is, our heart's going to be so perfected and purified. The love of God is going to be so washing over us in tenderness and love. And the light of Christ is going to be so genuinely a part of us. And everything that ever happened in our life is just going to be some form of an expression of God's glory and purpose. And we're just going to cherish every bit of it. And it's not about you and me. The thing that's important today is faith. And, it, and I tell you, if you walk by faith today, what will happen is you'll pick up a cross when it comes at you. And you'll die to yourself. I, I'm so thankful that I don't have to design my cross and then pick it up. I was a part of a religion once that that was what we tried to do. Craft our crosses. Because we wanted to embrace them. Well, you don't have to worry about Get out of the wood shop. You don't have to make any crosses. <laughs> They're strewn along your path. <laughs> Question is, are you going to kick them out of the way or are you going to pick them up and walk in them that day for God's glory? <clears throat> Look at this Lord's Prayer again in light of the big picture. If it's not about your glory, if it's about the glory of God, then we understand when we pray our Father who art in heaven, how will be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our heart's fixed. It's shifted. We have a different agenda. I don't care if blah, 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 blah happens for me here. If it does, great. If not, great. I'm, I'm, my goal is, may Christ be glorified in my body. What do I need? The, the personal prayers of earth are daily. Daily bread. Daily forgiveness. I, did, I just have little, little bits of need along the way. But the real objective, the real driving goal of life is for the glory of God. I got to check. I think there's one last closing. So back to the original verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So, what do you want? You want a shiny little meaningless seed? That in the end will be taken from you anyway? Or do you want to let that seed go? And trust God with the much fruit that he wants to bring? What is there today in your life that is precious and valuable to you? that you are clinging to for dear life, for fear that you might lose it if you don't protect it. Can you trust God for a greater glory to be preserved in your treasure? And let him preserve his glorious purpose by his own wisdom, no matter what. Let's pray. So Lord, that is our desire, that you would bless us with that singular faith and hope that it's your plan, that it's your purpose, that we bear much fruit. That's how we're going to be the disciples of Jesus. So I ask, Lord, for us that you know full well those things that we're clinging to, holding on to like their, ver their very survival is entirely up to our, to our own hands. So let it be, Lord, that we trust you instead. Let it be, Lord, that we uh, don't allow fear to win the day, but faith to let you take that which is dear to us and even let you, as it were, plant it like a seed so that it dies, so that it can truly bear much fruit. May our lives be, Lord, truly to your honor and glory. Not that we even understand, but that we by faith embrace it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 369. Hymn number 369. Let's close together.
Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side.